next up, Cardano and Tartaglia. So this is sort of an early Renaissance beef they had going on. And what they were arguing about was really, essentially, is Cardano a backstabbing bastard? It sound, it's no more mathematical than that. Although their contributions are, are exceptional, really. So you guys know the uh, quadratic formula, right? It sort of solves Cardano equations. So Cardano published this book called Ars Magna. And it was sort of like the end-all, be-all, like badass book of the time, right? And it had solutions for the cubic and quartic equations. Neither of them he made himself, but he gave credit to the people who did. And the reason why Tartaglia is in this story is because he is one of the people who invented this, this solution to the quartic, or cubic. Um, so him, background, he had a rough, 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 rough life. And he grew up in this city that was invaded by French soldiers when he was a kid. And they killed like 45,000 people in that city, which is more than half the population. And he got a sword straight across his face. And the reason he's called Tartaglia, because that's not actually his name, is because it damaged his jaw and his palate enough that he stuttered when he talked. They called him the stutterer. So he's sort of an underdog. People made fun of this guy. Um, he covered it up with his little pubic hair beard. Um, but in the end, you know, he was poor, he was impoverished, he self-educated. There's a story about him that goes, he had a private tutor that taught him the first half of the alphabet, and then their money ran out. So he had to learn the rest on his own. I mean, I doubt that story is true, but it sort of like gets the idea that like this guy is like, this is his image in history, right? Um, so he made a name for himself. Back in those days, um, the way you'd make a name for yourself as a mathematician was like dueling other mathematicians. So you'd walk up to a dude who was like known as smart and be like, yo, I bet I got a problem you can't solve. <laughs> so they sat down and they posed 30 problems to each other. This guy was important because he claimed to know how to solve cubics too. Um, he was full of shit though and he lost this duel like crazy. So you know, he was really famous for the while because he was, you know, he sought after he beat this guy. He embarrassed him. In front of everybody. Um, Cardano, on the other hand, was a rich kid. His father was a close friend of Leonardo da Vinci. He grew up as a doctor. He had money and servants and slaves and things. So, um, as a result of that, he's kind of like a dick. <laughs> like, he's hard headed and he's gung ho about things, and he has a project or idea in his head, and he's like, I need to do this, and I don't care what you say. So, at one point, you know, he's an astrologer, so he cast a horoscope for Jesus. And this is in Italy, so they're all cast and stuff, and they're all like, yo, his friends are like, yo, that's a bad idea. <laughs> and, and he did one anyway, and we'll come back to what happened about that. Um, so yeah, he published this Ars Magna, which is like the alpha and omega, omega of mathematics for like the next hundred years. Really, really important achievement. And like I said, he, he had these cubic and quartic equations, solutions in there, and that was what made it a special book, really, and, but he didn't claim credit for either of them. The quartic was sold by this guy Ferrari, who was a student of his, and the other one was supposedly Tartagula. So the story goes, Cardano wanted to publish this, Tartagula had it. Tartagula didn't want to give it to him, because if he gave it to him, then he wouldn't be able to win duels anymore, right? Because that's like the only thing he has to fight in a duel, like nobody can do that shit except him. Um, and that was actually pretty common in the day. So like, Cardano was, you know, he being the hard-headed person he is, he's like, no, I'm gonna get this. And he bugged him and bugged him and bugged him. And Tartaglia said, all right, if you promise to God to never, ever, 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 ever tell anybody this, I will give you a hint about my solution. So he gives him the hint and he promises to God, whatever, whatever. And then he later finds out a solution from this other guy who figured it out named Del Fioro. Del, hold on. I don't want to be wrong. Del Ferro. There we go. All right, so he, uh, he finds out the solution from that guy and he publishes it, but because he felt bad about sort of breaking his promise to Tartagula, he didn't find it out from him in the end, but he, you know, he, um, he credited him in this book. So Tartagula, regardless, is really, really, really pissed off. And he challenges him to a duel, like Tartagula does very well. And, um, but Cardano's like, nah, fuck that. Um, but his pupil Ferrari's like, all right, you wanna be a jerk? I'll be a jerk too. So they duel, and Ferrari kicks his ass. Like, Ferrari was a genius. I mean, he's the one who came up with the solution of the Quartic, and even though he was a, slu a student of Cardano, he was really probably way smarter. Um, so he lost, and everybody, of course, made fun of him. He couldn't get a job. Nobody liked him anymore. It, you know, it's Italy in the 1500s. Shit was hard. Um, <laughs> On the other hand, Cardano is famous, everybody loves him, he's like God, right? Until a long string of unfortunate events hits him. So the first is that his daughter was divorced for being a worthless forest bear. She never died of syphilis. His eldest son poisoned his wife and was arrested for it. His younger 
son robbed him, so Cardano cut his ears off. <laughs> um, and Tartaglia turned Cardano into the Spanish Inquisition in the Jesus horoscope thing. And oh, no. it turns out that his son Aldo also, you know, confessed some things that Cardano said about the Pope that were rather, um, you know, didn't cast in his favor. So he ended up getting thrown in jail for the rest of his life. Tartaglia, still nobody liked him. And really, the winner is mathematics, so give a round of applause for him. <laughs> this section. I apologize. Newton versus Leibniz. It's the great Biggie... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It has to be done. The great Biggie versus Tupac of history. It takes a while. But the main points are that really the entire universe fell down on one side or the other. And it really split Britain and the continent for a hundred years. They wouldn't talk to each other mathematically. Because essentially they both invented calculus with a different notation and they argued about who did it first. That's the story. Who did it first? Um, technically, Newton did it first, but he didn't publish. He waited nine years, and then um, Leibniz, in that time, published. Monad. Monad. The tree falls in the forest, right? I mean, according to these guys, the tree fell in a very big forest. All right, so um, next, we have feuds, we have eccentric people, we have crazy mathematicians. So these are mathematicians whose eccentricities really didn't work out for them in the end. Um, the most famous example is John Nash. Obviously, I mean, this, he's a schizophrenic. He won the Nobel Prize in 1984 for his work in game theory. Um, Beautiful Mind won a bunch of Academy Awards, and as soon as that movie came out, everybody and their mother likes to pretend they know stuff about John Nash. And they're like, <laughs> you know, I was a math major, and some people would come up to me from history major and be like, oh my god, you know, I love math. I actually, game theory, I think is really, really cool. Prisoner's Dilemma, and I mean, for me, it was kind of funny, but I think it kind of proves my point, though. It's really, like, when, once a mathematician becomes humanized in this way, it becomes, like, the coolest thing in the world. Whereas previously, like, nobody wanted to have anything to do with math. Um, so, John Nash's Prisoner Dilemma is really a Shane Vera t-shirt of intro to econ classes. And, um, as a side note, too, Nash was inspired to study mathematics by this book by E.T. Bell called Men of Mathematics. It was published in, like, 1937. It's Men of Mathematics. Um, and he, it's really just a bunch of vignettes about mathematicians. There's not much math in it, and that was what really inspired Nash to pursue mathematics, the humanism of it, right? Okay. So, Kurt Gödel, he's a gangster too. Einstein was a close friend of him, and he said that in his later years, the only reason he went to work is so that he could walk home with Kurt Gödel. Aww. He's a gangster. So, um, one thing that this links into is, you know, Hilbert again. At the 19th turn of the century, he really, Hilbert, you know, sexy guy in the little parentheses, um, he was really concerned with linking mathematicians together. He actually ended the beef between Britain and continental Europe. He was like, guys, Newton's dead, it's over. Um, so, and he also really wanted to push an axiomatic axiomatization of mathematics, it's a hard word to say. Um, which means basically that you develop a set of rules, and on those rules you can prove everything, like the roots to a tree, and all the leaves in the universe will sprout from this tree, right? So, this is like the task that for 50, 60 years all mathematicians are working towards. They're trying to find this system that is perfect, or prove that it can be done at least. And Godot comes along and proves that it's impossible. <sighs> So he proved the incompleteness theorem, which basically means there are true statements that we cannot prove in any system of logic. So given a system of logic, there are things that are true that that system can never prove. So it is absolutely impossible to ever think of any set of axioms that from which all truth will spread. And it kind of like killed the optimism of science and mathematics. <laughs> you know, Christians got a second win because they're like, ha, so we can't ever really prove that God exists because, you know, it really brought up a lot of philosophical questions for the mid-90s, or mid-1900s. <laughs> um, so Godel, here's the crazy part of Godel. You know, as he grew older, he got paranoid, and he got, he was really obsessive about thinking somebody was trying to poison him, and he had to have his wife taste all of his food. <laughs> then, unfortunately, at some point, his wife went to the hospital, and Godel couldn't eat anymore. <laughs> so he starved himself to death. And when he died, he weighed 65 pounds. He refused to eat. It's heartbreaking because he was such a brilliant man. But it's also kind of funny because he started something. 